Okay, so I think we are ready uh, to go. I would like to welcome everyone uh, for today's lecture, which is entitled Programming for Peace, Computer-Aided Methods for International Conflict Resolution and Prevention. And uh, as usual, within this format of the UFG Peaceful Change Lectures, uh, we have two audiences, so I welcome uh, the audience on Zoom and I welcome uh, the audience on Facebook. And uh, just to reiterate basically our rules of the game, uh, so the presenter is going to talk for about half an hour or so, and, uh, and then uh, both audiences will have ample opportunity to ask questions. Uh, the Zoom crowd is going to do that uh, via virtually raising their hand. And, uh, and our audience on Facebook is requested uh, to type their questions and comments, and I'm going to read them then uh, to the presenter. Um, I just want to introduce you very, very quickly to uh, today's presenter. Uh, that is uh, Professor mm -hmm. Robert Trappel, who is uh, the head of the Austrian Research Institute for Artificial Intelligence, which you can see there in the background. <laughs> and which really is an amazing uh, institution. And, uh, and some of uh, the people in the audience, you may be surprised, it's been founded in 1984. So it's actually quite visionary, uh, if, you, if you think about it. Because in our days, everyone talks about artificial intelligence. At that time, not that many people did. And... Um, the uh, about our speaker today he is really a magnificent uh, and highly highly accomplished scholar so um i looked through uh, his cv and uh, just a few things that i wanted to mention so most of us uh, they have one degree in in one discipline yeah so i have a political science degree and that's that and, uh, and Professor Trappel has uh, degrees in sociology, psychology. There was a minor on astronomy in electrical engineering. And he also has an MBA in general management. So it's a very, very rounded <laughs> education. And um, he uh, already mentioned that he is the head of the Austrian Research Institute for Artificial Intelligence. He's also Professor Emeritus of Medical Cybernetics and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Vienna. Um, he has published uh, over 180 articles, over 35 books, uh, and has won many awards. Uh, and I'm really gonna, gonna, gonna stop there. I just wanna mention one thing that I find uh, particularly amazing. Uh, we usually have economists here talking about the economics of international relations or political scientists about the political decision making process or something like that. And uh, Professor Trappel has reached out actually, so from very much in line actually with the many different subjects that he has studied, he reached out um, much beyond the, the, the narrow nuts and bolts of, uh, of the study of artificial intelligence. And amongst other things, he has really reached into, into politics and he's interested in, in, in peace. He's interested in, in conflict resolution. Uh, he also published on a multicultural world. Uh, so there's, there, there's definitely a, 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 a political science side, that's how I would put it. Uh, to his work. And uh, Robert, we're very, very happy uh, that you're with us today. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over the word to you. Thank you very much, Marcus. That's very great of you. Um, I have to say or to confess, it's not the first time I'm lecturing in the um, academy because uh, I was asked by Ernst Florian Winter some times ago because he thought that uh, students of diplomacy should also know something about computers. And he asked me to lecture about that. So I talked with them about uh, logic, about uh, automata, what computers could do, um, if it's possible to model 
uh, parts of the world or the whole world, which was impossible with computers at this time and so on. And that took place 1966. So it's now about 55 years ago that I have the pleasure and honor to talk um, virtually uh, at the Diplomatic Academy. Um, it was very funny for me meeting later at different occasions people uh, who were ambassadors telling me, oh, I remember you, etc. But then um, Ernst Florian Winter ended his directorship in 1967 and the following director probably saw that computers were something that uh, diplomats never would get in touch with. <laughs> and so he stopped my lecture, or at least I didn't get an invitation to continue. Um, the basis um, of this book, um, and uh, Marcus invited me to talk about that, um, was uh, the Second World War, actually. Um, I was born in 1939, so I experienced or I suffered to experience the Second World War. We ran into bunkers. Uh, we came out, we saw the destroyed houses where we were afraid. My father came, came home, was lying for, your, for four years in the hospital and died of tuberculosis. So from the beginning of my life, I was thinking if I ever learned something which could maybe could help to prevent the outbreaks of wars or to help end them, then I should devote some time to that. And uh, when I saw that AI was more and more involved into making better under several quotes um, warfare, I thought, is it possible to use it for peace fair? And so I invited several people from different uh, countries and naturally from our research institute cooperate. And we were lucky that our ministry, not of exterior affairs, but of science at that time, um, decided to donate a prize for uh, working in that area. And uh, there were three prizes and many, many people who applied and uh, luckily we got one of these prizes, which, were, which was three million shillings, not euro. But uh, still, that was quite a lot of time, so we could also uh, help uh, people in other countries to continue their work. And this book is the result. And um, now I will switch, if I can do this, most of the time it works, to this page. And I click on that. And one of the miracles I didn't dream in 66 is now that here you see the page you see our research institute unfortunately it's only two windows in the third floor but in the shopping gas which continues at the left side it's 10 or 12 more windows 
So we are not so small, but we have a beautiful view on palaces and so on. So that's uh, our, and now I have to go here because the other key doesn't work. This is the book you have seen. Let me perhaps brief repeat AI definitions I have here. Two of them, developing computer programs which approximate human intelligence or surpass it. And it's more than intelligence. It's many other aspects in the meantime, including the detection or the simulation of emotions. And the second is developing computer models for better understanding human thinking. It was rarely, or it is rarely thought of that capabilities that with modern computer, it is possible to model at least columns in the cortex of the brain, to model some of the whole connectome in the brain. So we are approaching to better, better computer models of the brain. Um, and I had the, pl the pleasure of being one of the cooperators in the human brain project of the European Union. Um, the title of that sounded more promising. Um, then the results were and are, but uh, yeah, it's a moonshot project. Um, next thing is what are methods of AI? And here I do want only to talk about symbolic models. Maybe we come later or in the discussion um, to non-symbolic models and the capabilities, but the problems they have. So one of them is knowledge representation and databases are one of them. And uh, we will in the very soon see different databases which had to be collected in order uh, just to run our models on them. It's problem solving, search planning, one of them is expert systems, perception and action, for example, robots and the uh, robot soldier now is a very, very hot topic. Understanding and expressing language and speech, and that includes emotion, intelligent, and I would add emotional software agents, and machine learning. And now today I only will discuss decision trees, not the non-symbolic machine learning methods, deep learning, uh, or this is one of the questions, then I'm happy to go into that too. Yeah, and uh, this is the book, and the book is from 2006. So what I can show you first is an overview about chapters of the book. And naturally I can't and will not go into details. Most of them of part one are collection of information, namely in databases and their further development and analysis by statistical means. Second is, uh, Ah, one I should mention, sorry, especially. 
that is the Confident 2002 data set. Confident means conflict management. And I have noted here uh, how many elements was. It was at that time world and the, the biggest conflict management database worldwide. It uh, comprised 218 variables for each conflict management. It um, had uh, altogether 5,066 conflict management attempts. Unfortunately, it was, we could help to upgrade it for the last five years until 2000 uh, from, I think, 90, uh, 1993. And, uh, but then, as far as I know, it was not longer continued. Um, oh, sorry, that's wrong. Maybe that's a little bit complicated. Yeah, then this is application of complex analytical made methods like wavelet analysis, hidden Markov models, multi-layer perceptrons, self-organizing maps, case-based reasoning, decision trees, rule learning, and uh, I will focus on a little bit case-based reasoning and decision trees. I have my very uh, not computerized watch here uh, to, to see when I have to end. Um, and that were some of the very, very uh, complex models which were used. And then the third part, that was also very interesting because new approaches, some only theoretical studies, but the others with a strong application component. And uh, the last but one was by Kirsty Bellman, a uh, peacemaker, 2020, and the book was published 2006. And this is a review back from 2015. How worked Peacemaker, this special program, what, what were the advantages and what turned out to be really not functioning. And uh, I added, because I found out that in all these chapters, there was only once the word terrorist mentioned. And at that time, we had quite a lot of terrorist attacks. So I looked what exists in that and I added that. I influenced, I was influenced by a book of Herwig Münker, uh, the Neuen Krieg and the New Wars, which appeared in the year 2002. Now, I want to focus on one chapter, one of the many, as you have seen, machine learning methods for better understanding, resolving, and preventing international conflicts, which was for me, the main aim of the book. And one of the questions we had was the Bosnia-Herzegovina conflict. You may remember that at that time, uh, Sir, the, the president of the Republic of Serbia, uh, Milosevic, Slobodan Milosevic, who 
before the split of Yugoslavia was the president of whole Yugoslavia, wanted to win back several of these independent provinces. In that fight, uh, even several uh, ammunitions hit Austria when it was attempted to win Slovenia back to big uh, Yugoslavia. And the question at that time, which was among uh, most of political decision makers in international politics, to watch conflict is this conflict similar, uh, similar. And there were two aspects. One of them was, uh, don't enter. It will end like the Vietnam War. You will have on the ground, in the air, wars, a conflict uh, for years. Please do them let, as was mentioned, bleed out. It will end by itself. And the other said, no, no, there is a specific dictator which won his province, namely Serbia, uh, to uh, now invade with force into all other remaining provinces. You have to end that as early. We used uh, the conflict, not conflict management database, but it was called COSIMO, Conflict Simulations Model by uh, Professor Frank Fetch of the Institute for Political Science of uh, Tübingen, sorry, Heidelberg. And uh, he decided uh, to give us his database with more or less all military conflicts between the five volumes. It came out as a book um, in uh, about this uh, conflict, military conflict since 1945. I think it was to 1990 or yes. And uh, he asked the coder, one of the coder, please take the Bosnia-Herzegovina conflict and model that with the same uh, variables as you did for all these other military conflicts. And we will try to, to find out what is the nearest conflict from a distance measure? I could tell quite a lot more about case-based reasoning. We look to find out what is the closest conflict in our list. And if I show you the result, it is German, Czechoslovakia, the Munich Treaty. When uh, Chamberlain and Daladier said, oh, nothing will happen and let this dictator uh, continue peaceful or, and the result of this decision not to intervene. You may remember there was an intervention, but quite late in, in Serbia, very late, years uh, after this beginning. And uh, I don't know. We, we made it and, uh, and it's a result. <laughs> it's an impact result as uh, most people who work in that area experience.
No, the next thing is decision tree. I just don't know how you learned it, uh, what decision trees are. I encourage you to, to invest, uh, let's say, three minutes. What is a decision tree? Ross Quinlan made this wonderful, very simple example. A British lady decides to walk out, to walk her dog every day. But it's dependent on the weather. If the outlook is sunny, overcast or rain, temperature hot or mild or cool, humidity high, normal, windy, false or true. And then this is her in the last column. That's her decision. What can you do? Decision trees, very simple are. You look to that variable which has the highest influence on the dependent variable. And the measure, the measure is an entropy measure, which I won't explain here in detail, but what has the strongest influence. And then this is the root of your tree. Then you look to all the others, which has the strongest influence depending on outlook. If this is sunny, overcast or rain, for example, or could temperature hot, etc. So if you have outlook, for example, sunny, what is the variable which influences most? And the result I easily can show, it's outlook. Uh, unfortunately, um, I said it first, but it is. If it's sunny, overcast and rain, if the outlook is overcast, she always walks. She doesn't care of humidity or if it's windy. When it's Sunday, she looks for humidity. If it's high, then she doesn't walk the dog. If it's normal, yes. And windy, if it's rain, it depends on windy, yes, no. Well, that was constructed in such a way that there is an easy outcome. One, one additional advantage of Ah, shocks. I have to go back one. Yeah. One advantage is if you have many variables and it's difficult to collect the information, then you see temperature doesn't show up. So if you take a small sample or middle-sized sample, and one variable doesn't show up, you need no longer collect it. So this is also one of the several advantages of decision trees. Now let me go to more complex things, and that is, oh, um, I wanted to show a picture of Jacob. The last time I met him, he told me he has cancer and he's afraid of not living very long, which unfortunately, a wonderful, a great scientist, a wonderful person and died really too early. And that is, we applied it for, it's, I think it's important, conflict management. When is conflict management successful and when is it not? And it turned out, if you have, if the number of fatalities is higher than 700,000, the successes are two cases, the failures 33. If it is less 
than 700,000, then it depends on the management activity. It depends if it's negotiation, if it's mediation, or if it's other. If it's another method, you have four successes, four to one failures. And then management activity, but I see I have only a few minutes, so I have to shorten that, is uh, if you take other, you have so many failures, then it depends on the civil liberties of part A. That's the one who is the one who starts more or less the conflict. Sometimes it may be difficult, but who starts really, really to employ weapons and to fight? And here you see, oh, sorry, ah, no. Yeah, and here you see, it depends on fatalities. If the number of fatalities and you have negotiation, then success is 25, failure is uh, 19. So there is a larger chance for success and etc. And I needed a second, a second role to continue that. I have to skip that, I'm sorry. What we tried is, is it possible to say what is the best mediation strategy in a situation? When do I have the greatest chances to be successful? And I have here procedural, directive, communicative. In communicative, people can sit this, then, there, the mediator communicates the position of the other persons, of the other, sorry, of the other group. In procedural, it's more strict. And in directive, it's really a directive. Now comes the next, this has to happen, etc. And here it depends on, for example, the rank of the mediator, the previous relation of the mediator to the two different groups. And here also, again, fatalities. So, we can give very limited, but we can give recommendations. And I will switch off one of these lights here. I'm sorry. Yes, this is a little bit better. I hope so. And, uh, and so you can give recommendations. What is the best strategy in a specific situation. We uh, constructed uh, an international conflict management interactive tool because we were asked, that was one of the major results by ECHO. And ECHO at that time had the title um, European uh, humanitarian aid office. In the meantime, it's called European Civil, Lib Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations. It sounds more dynamic to have operations than instead of a bureaucratic office, perhaps. And uh, I can't tell you uh, how often that used because it's, it's direct uh, change two years later and uh, nobody of the people there at that time were there. Um, I see I have my 
uh, 30 minutes. I thank you for your attention, which I don't see, but I assume. I thank you and uh, that's time for a discussion. On the normal person chances, you would get a big round of applause now here. It's virtual, but still. And um, so we're going to move to questions and answers. And um, Robert, just one request. Could you unshare the screen? Oh, sorry. Because then it's... Uh, yes. Then I... it's easier to navigate. Yes, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, so as I know, yes. everyone, we're going to start with the with the Zoom audience with the questions. And uh, Robert, if it's OK, I'm going to bundle always five questions together. OK, I made notes. Yeah, <laughs> if they are long. Yeah. I think there'll be quite a lot, yeah. And, uh, and please, so feel free to ask uh, questions. Uh, it is obviously a little different, yeah, so methodologically probably uh, more sophisticated that, that some of you are used to, uh, but please do not be intimidated by it. Uh, this, it's, a, it's a really important and actually really fascinating kind of uh, research. Um, Dennis, I think you were the first one uh, who, to raise the hand, yes. Hey, uh, thank you. Yes, thank you for the uh, presentation. I have a more general question about the development and the research behind AI, um, since it's still a, quite a young technology and we don't know what it brings. And it highly depends on the data that's fed into algorithms and all those aspects of it. I'm wondering, um, countries like China with its social credit rating system, um, uh, of course, have other um, means to do research on a AI. And my question is how that affects um, the international, let's call it power balance between, let's say, China, more author authoritarian systems and Europe or the United States, where, of course, we can access much of the data that China has due to laws and human rights. Um, and I'm wondering um, whether we will see a kind of an arms race, if you will, in terms of AI in the future and what difference it actually makes um, in state-sponsored R&D in terms of um, whether China might arrive at a certain technological level sooner than other countries, given its authoritarian system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Then uh, next one on my list is Mele, please. Uh, yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, for the presentation. My question would be: um, these models that you have you have presented, um, in your opinion, are they also applicable to to new forms of conflict? For example, hybrid conflicts that utilize both military and non-military means, where it may be not as simple to quantify the, if I may call it, the costs. For example, in your cases the fatalities uh, that were incurred during a conflict or the number of combatants that were used. So uh, in, in conflicts where this may not be as easy to quantify, would these models also work? Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. And then we're gonna move on to Marianne, please. Thank you. Um, I would have um, one question which refers to, because when I boil it down, you have those like computer aided methods mechanisms and it's basically based on data algorithms and computing power so I was wondering if first of all how much can you actually test um, certain mechanisms before you kind of deploy it in the real world and then when it comes to computing power how much do you see that as a limiting factor um, and then my other question is how do you actually secure accountability um, maybe more a legal question but yeah thank you. Okay. Then the next one is Anastasia, please. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for this outstanding uh, presentation. And uh, this topic for me is quite quite new, and I uh, didn't know before much about uh, about this technology. And I'm kind of wondering about general uh, questions. So. Uh, how can I apply this uh, knowledge, these AI technologies uh, in analyzing conflicts? Can I analyze any conflicts using these AI technologies? And uh, um, how can I, um, for example, I'm writing right now my master thesis about uh, Arab-Israeli conflict and about uh, recent developments uh, actually that are uh, taking place right now. So probably 
uh, how can I use this AI uh, technique uh, to uh, add some value, for example, from my research? Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Mm -hmm. And then the last one now, if I count it correctly, then we are at five. The last one is the uh, thread piece. Hello, and thank you for your presentation. So I would have two questions. Um, first of all, my first question is, um, seeing as human error or decision-making has an individual at fault, who's in charge of controlling the AI missteps? You mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that one of the goals of AI is to transcend human error. Um, but at the end of the day, these programs are created by human beings. So how is it possible to transcend human error and who can be held responsible if an AI program is at fault? And then my second question is more forward looking. So given the current phenomenon of, phenomenon of cryptocurrencies in general and crypto trading in particular, and the interrelated nature of international trade and conflict, do you see the future of AI moving more towards analyzing digital crypto markets in order to further facilitate an environment for peaceful trade? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> lots, of, lots of broad questions. Uh, Robert, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Alone for the first question, I would, I think it would take half an hour. Um, yeah, but first, great. I admire you for these excellent students. If they are students, super. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> yes, I'll try my best. Um, the distribution and the first one was uh, mentioning power, power distribution between China, Europe, USA, uh, with the different approaches uh, to AI and different um, organizers of research in AI. In the US, it's uh, only partially big companies, but naturally they are more influential probably than the government. Um, but uh, the defense advanced research projects agency, the DARPA spends billions on the research in AI, most of them directed to weaponry. Um, how the power distribution will change depends on many things. It depends on will China succeed as it did before uh, to get the most smartest equipment and development from Euro free of charge. I may remember you that they bought the majority of KUKA, um, the, the company that builds the best robots worldwide. And that was agreed by the German government and by the European commission because we have free trade and everyone can buy everything. If Europe remains as stupid, it does, it gives the impression it does no longer because then forget about Europe. Actually, the development in China and in uh, in the USA, these are the two strongholds. Europe um, has may be successful in developing the best ethical system worldwide. We are now focusing to have the best ethical principles to develop them, which is great, but I am afraid it shows that's the cheapest way instead of investing money into AI development or AI development uh, directed to protect Europe. So 
Um, I don't know who will win. I am also very unhappy about the social credit system, uh, which uh, China develops now. It tests it in provinces, but it will probably develop it more. It may be, it is a different culture in China than in the USA. Maybe individualism is less important in China than a group thinking. Could be, I don't know. And I don't know if there are exact results so people adapt to that easier. Um, as a summary, I recently talked to a colleague from the MIT, an AI professor, and said, I suppose the greatest problem for you is that Google and Amazon buy the best students and assistants from you, and you can't compete. And he said, no, it's the Chinese. They offer the highest salary and the best equipment. I hope this is not the final summary, but for now, it is. Number two was hybrid conflicts. Is it applicable? Um, that was my problem at when finishing uh, the book and putting it together into a volume. That terrorism uh, at that time came up and the question was, is that applicable? In that form, I would say no. We need different databases. Uh, we have all the others were dependent on, not easily, but on measurable things. You can, how many people are there, how many soldiers, how many weapons, how many submarines, etc. And that has changed so much. I think we will need other databases as a beginning. What I don't know is, do they not exist already? And we don't know about it? I would assume. And I'm sure there are many information structures which we don't have any access to. We could, however, try to develop better ones and maybe we are successful. But it's fully true in hybrid conflicts, the situation is quite, quite different. It's no longer that the one princess takes his army and the other bear on his other army, they shoot against each other, which remained for a very long time easily uh, to be measured. It was a little bit more difficult in the Second World War where both groups used before unknown methods like radio, like television, like movies, and that was used from both uh, parties, if I may say parties, uh, both uh, groups and and with the internet and with ai systems who can simulate people persons which was used even at the in the united states and the, in the uh, last elections um then yeah, it has become very, very different. Fully agree. New models. Third was, um, how can uh, blah, 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 blah. What was that? computing power? Um, no, is the computing power of today? Well, I would say yes. We have meteorological models 
which consume enormous amount of computing power. Um, we have high energy physics uh, to find subatomic sub particles which exists for 10 uh, to the minus 20 second uh, and use them. So I think we could also use them for modeling uh, more world encompassing systems. Um, legal questions, very difficult question. Um, there, in, in that respect, uh, Europe, I'm quite sure it's better. Uh, the, the last thing, now the European made a proposal, what should be allowed, what should be not allowed. Um, there was a group, uh, one of the members of that is Mark Kuckelberg, a professor at the University of Vienna, an ethicist, uh, and uh, and they made the first proposal, and uh, it's so long. I have it somewhere here. I didn't read it to the end. I can't tell. But the uh, Datenschutzgrundverordnung, the DGSVO, where many people are afraid had some aspect which is very interesting and which I found out by reading a paper of a professor of an American law school. And she said, we should adapt that. If a decision is made by a computer program, by an AI program, if that decision is of importance to you, for example, will you get a course in the employment system uh, or not? Or you, will you get a credit in this that I'm not a social, but money credit or not? Every person has the right to explain how this computer made the decision. Now you will say, oh, that's AI, that's impossible. No, in that case, you have the right to request a neutral person, an expert, to explain to you on what it is based in an explainable way. And for me, that's one a total progress already made by the DSGVO. Um, I don't know the English name, please ex excuse me. Um, and that, uh, that I find is, is really um, an excellent idea, but very difficult because the non-symbolic processes give hardly any explanation. And if I would have more time, I could give you example. I have slides here, but uh, I no don't know when our session ends, has to end. Marcus? No, don't worry about it. So okay, so maybe I could later show a, yes. Few, yes. a few slides of that. Yes, great. So this is, I think, very important, the ethical question. I find it super that the European community, I can say, because, you know, it's three different um, instances, has decided that everybody has the right to know on how this decision was made if it's not made by a human being. Super. Number four was, oh, AI general. Um, how can I use AI to analyze conflicts? Um, perhaps we should arrange for a meeting and I discuss that with uh, 
the lady Anastasia because I think that takes longer. Yeah, all the others can take longer too. Five was, oh, that's, um, how can, yeah, that's a good idea. How can AI transcend uh, human error? And yes, I think uh, AI is, uh, is great in transcending human error. It's uh, also great in, uh, is less great in transcending uh, human intelligence. It's, uh, it's, we do AI because we are not smart enough with our natural intelligence. Um, yes, it's that's very difficult. We can do horrible things with AI. I am sure, unless we're careful, very careful, you know that there is uh, not only one, several books which say in the long run, AI or robots will govern uh, humanity, all humans, because they are smarter. They have more information. I was recently invited to a um, philosophy conference and uh, I gave a talk on a robot deus because I thought, now, well, what's the difference of a smart robot? He nearly knows all. He has internet access and in databases in which he can intrude, he knows all. He nearly can do all what he wants. He sees all what he wants, etc. So the difference of a real God and the computer God is not so small. And we have to be very careful that we don't transcend this border. For now, I don't see a risk in the next 30, 40 years, but um, in the long run, I just don't know. But we can think about that, how to protect that. In cryptocurrency, I have no idea. The only positive thing which I know is there is a chance that the computing power needed for cryptocurrency can be reduced. It was possible to apply that these computers in this program, less the computer system, who was successful to win the Go game, was DeepMind, um, against the best Go player in the world to reduce the energy consumption of itself, of the game to, I think, from 100 to 5%. So hopefully we have a chance that cryptocurrencies uh, are now become less devastating are they, than they are now for our energy production. That's really crazy what's now happening. And uh, though it's totally secret and undistractable, etc. But the price is too high. And there's something has to happen. Yeah, it's the first five. <laughs> five. Well, but I'm going to come in because from the, from, the, from the Zoom people, I don't have any more questions. Oh, yeah. But anyway, I have, I have questions from the, from, the, from the Facebook people. And I'm going to couch them a little bit in my own words because I'm very interested in what you do. So I have to ask questions too. <laughs> and I want to ask two of them. And um, the first one is, uh, is basically about modeling the modeling. So um, yeah. perhaps in the future, um, in crisis situations, 
um, crisis actors themselves are going to use artificial intelligence to strategize, to think ahead about the yes. the other. Yes. And um, and I was wondering what uh, whether how you could capture that, how you could analyze that. Perhaps on the one hand, it could make things even easier because it's after all that perhaps also just an algorithm that needs to be identified. On the other mm -hmm. hand, uh, it's technically probably quite sophisticated. The Absolutely. other question I had yeah. was, um, so when you, when you presented your book uh, entitled Programming for Peace, then you talked a lot about mediation. Yes. And I, in a, and I fully agree with you. That's a very, very important part of, of, make, of peace and making peace. Um, but I was wondering about other forms of peace. So uh, disarmament, arms control, for instance, came to my mind. So um, if one looks at um, research now in international security, then, then artificial intelligence is basically uh, depicted as some kind of a ghost and, and massive because uh, uh, immediately when people start talking about uh, killer robots and autonomous weapons, semi autonomous weapons, and everything. And my, 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 my question there is um, would perhaps to put it very succinctly, there, so there are probably uh, possibilities of programming for war. And, uh, and, 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 and what possibilities do we have if we want to program for peace in order to counter this programming? for war. And um, one could probably um, play around with that. Uh, so basically the dependent variable, the, the piece, um, what other facets one, one could look at. Uh, conflict prevention probably uh, could, be, could be one of them as well. So I was just wondering in terms of how you would extend um, your model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These two questions, yes. Um, I fully agree that the more AI we use, uh, the more if a counterpart which has uh, can find out what decisions are made by the other, other per, by the other program, then if it's done maybe by a human being. Um, a few years ago, I had the maybe sounding a little bit crazy idea, why not use in computer games um, agents which are slightly unpredictable, namely who are slightly neurotic. If you have a psychotic one, well, they lose, not they are out of their mind, more or less. Maybe in an interesting world, but not in this one. So with a neur neurotic, it could be better. So we made a simulation having aggressive, less aggressive, um, and different agents, and one of them was slightly neurotic, not much. And it turned out he won most of the games. Mm -hmm. Probably this slight unpredictability is also an advantage for us humans. So I used the title neuroticism as an advantage maybe also for humans. So it could be developed uh, in the long run, that more neurotic people are successful <laughs> in becoming professors or something <laughs> like that. So the predictability of an opposite system really is a risk, yes. If you mean that, I would fully agree with that, yeah. Uh, but it shouldn't be, um, total unpredictability or just random. Not you could add random numbers and uh, not that's uh, 
So to that, I would fully agree. Yes, you have, I did mediation because my then experts uh, 20 years ago about said, this is, uh, and I think that was the beginning of the arms control at that time. Or was it much earlier? I don't know. And uh, yes, that, that, and shouldn't one include AI systems into, uh, for example, arms control? Um, regarding soldier robots, um, there was a call uh, for signatures among AI researchers to limit their actions that they can be addressed only against other robots. So using weapons only against other robot warriors, but not at human beings. But uh, the problem gets more and more difficult since you know that even in principle democratic countries use uh, drones uh, to kill citizens, even if they are soldiers or generals of others, but they kill them. And, um, and uh, the question is, uh, will they turn over to automatic killing them uh, by identifying them and, uh, and no human is sitting in a box in Texas and, uh, and uh, doing that. Or three men in boxes and doing that and nobody knows who has killed him, not like it was when uh, a melaton of soldiers shot, shot uh, and one of them had no pattern in his rifle, so everybody could think I didn't do it. But but that's it. It is a, a, a tremendous risk. But I I don't think it's so easy to detect that to detect and a rocket, um, an atom bomb, atomic bomb is sure easier than to find a smart, detect a smart system somewhere. And I don't know if we have so good hackers in, uh, in our, uh, countries or the United States uh, to find out what in the Chinese AI labs is going on. I don't know. Robert, thank you. Thank you very much. There don't seem to be any more questions. Anyone more questions? Do we have a ch just chance to show a few slides? Definitely. Yes, why it's so Definitely. difficult. Yeah. Oh, erhobene hand by Morges Teshome. Morges is there, yes. <laughs> okay. I see it here. Yeah. There you go. Okay, Th thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah, since there is no other person who is asking, I have just one question because I'm interested in conflict management. Yeah. So in your presentation, Professor, you were saying that uh, sometimes it is better to make early intervention in an ongoing conflict, right? Yes. Especially international intervention. Yes. When would foreign intervention appear to be productive or unproductive in terms of time? Oh, in terms of time. Yes. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, but I but there are many more questions now, so I'm going to bundle again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah, yeah. <laughs> paper. Yes. Good. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should I have paper more than <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So the next one is uh, Karina. 
Thank you very much for your interesting talk. I have a short question which relates to your definition. So in the beginning, you stated that um, develop that uh, AI means developing computer models for better understanding human thinking. Yeah. And um, a while ago, I, re I read a book um, in which it's um, explained on, on neuroscience that human thinking is actually changing and adapting due to um, new technologies such as phones, because humans um, are basically kind of more reacting, reacting faster to things that need to process more information. And um, I was curious whether this kind of mind change, that's actually yeah. also the title of the book, um, would somehow um, need to be considered by AI and or whether AI would change through this. Thanks a lot. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we have one more now on the list, that's Ivan. Ivan. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor, for the eye opener of today. Well, uh, funny, like a few weeks ago, I was thinking to myself, uh, how great would it be to have uh, an AI software which has all the relevant conflicts mapped out in terms of various variables, which would help researchers uh, draw conclusions, perhaps predictions, or make an informed comparisons. So you mentioned this one project that you carried out, which was uh, from 80s to 90s something. So I was wondering, is there a more comprehensive study which would map more historically relevant situations or at least 20th century when the warper was, so to say, more or less similar mm -hmm. to 50s? I mean, going deeper in the past, of course, would uh, raise all kinds of uh, questions of the bias and relevance of information at disposal and so on. But so at least for the 20th century, is there a more comprehensive study mm -hmm. which maps out all these things? Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And this is now the last opportunity to ask any questions. So either seize it or it's too late. <laughs> no, I think they're all happy. So I am equipped. Okay, so you could <laughs> talk <to> you. <laughs> so <laughs> no limit. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> so I'm gonna hand, hand, hand over the word to you again to answer the question. Yeah, okay. Um what was yes, the time of intervention. That I can say. This is one very specific thing where there was one moment and, uh, and that was the moment when the question was raised. So uh, we, our impression was there is, we didn't, uh, what was mentioned was the Vietnam War and the Vietnam War was so distant from the conflict between Serbia who invaded other provinces that uh, we, we just said it, it from, from that point of view, it would have made sense immediately intervene uh, the probability of resulting a situation like in Vietnam was not given. Okay, but I don't know which other situation is there. I don't have this database and this database is last century, uh, honestly. And uh, maybe one could try similar measures to say, ah, there is a conflict situation, which one is similar? But uh, many of the conflicts nowadays, at least those ones between big powers will not be similar like that. That is very unlikely because there are other means now um, to disturb or closely to destroy an enemy. Uh, remember uh, the uh, blocking of an important pipeline in the US. If you do this intentionally in many places, 
the US will be frozen. I don't know if the Americans have the same uh, capable hackers there. I don't know that they could block Russia or if China does it uh, to retaliate. I just don't know. So the second was AI, yes, brain changes, mind changes. Well, does the mind change? Obviously it does change, but probably it's connectivity. Nobody has found suddenly existing neural cells, neurons which haven't existed 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, no one has found that suddenly uh, different chemical transmitter substances showed up unless they were artificial somehow transmitter substances naturally, which I used uh, to help in uh, psychiatric diseases. Um, so it's a question of adaptability. And I assume uh, AI hasn't changed, uh, has, doesn't have to change. And I think that um, we are still far away from the minute details of the brain. Or let's pose it, when we know more about details than we knew 20 years ago. It's an enormous progress, new technologies, uh, but uh, AI, and even these AI models are at the level where the far away that processing by using uh, smartphones influences, would influence them nowadays. Um, third question. Um, there is, we found out something which really puzzled us when, sorry for the water. And then comes briefly chocolate. <laughs> um, the, that uh, we found out when we used our models, let's say, what is, uh, which kind of mediation should one do? They look different before and after 1989. When we saw a sudden uh, collapse of one of the superpowers, namely that of the Soyuz Sovietsky Socialist Republic, which became Russland um, in the long run with satellites and many of them left. And uh, we, we had better predictions. So maybe if there is only one superpower, it's easier to predict. Uh, yes, you, you're not, yeah. So we found that out and we were surprised and said, that's interesting. We get more stable results, better predictive. And now it has changed, not in the meantime, but uh, after 1989, it was more stable. So, um, I, so I don't know how how good one could model conflicts for that uh, time. I honestly have to say, um, I just don't know. We, we did in this time span and to extrapolate if I understood the, the question correctly, I wouldn't dare, but it may be interesting for historians. 
could be to use our models uh, when will a war break out? Yeah, so that's even uh, so amongst the, the data sets that, are, that I know in international relations, yeah. uh, they, they usually end, uh, they go, go down to, let's say, early 19th century, but that's it. That's the, the, yeah. They can't do more than that. And uh, Robert, I was, I was, I was laughing when you said about uh, or smiling when you, when you said the, the one with the predictability and the one superpower. Yeah. You know, uh, because the, the person who invented that data set that I was just talking about, J. David Singer, he says the same. Aha, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and yeah. his, his, his argument is the more the more great powers you have, actually, the more unstable. Oh, okay. Right. Well, yeah. now it's only n equals two. The two groups say that, but still, it's very yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah. And one has a good explanation for that, no? Yeah, no, but it's it's often interesting. So if one if one sees work that is a little bit related but still different, but nevertheless comes up with similar results, that that means that the results. Thank you. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to hear that. No? Yeah. <laughs> No, so I think um, we, um, I think there are no more questions. Yeah. Then uh, let me take the opportunity again and thank Robert a lot for this, for this really fascinating talk. Uh, maybe you're going to stay on afterwards for a little bit because I, I, I still have questions for you, but I don't want to uh, hold up, uh, hold up things for the audience. I'd like to thank the audience again uh, for being with us. Uh, and uh, maybe preview the next event that we have in the, within the, the, the OFK Peaceful Change uh, Working Group. And that is going to be a big conference on Austrian foreign policy. Uh, um, so from the mid 1950s till now. And that uh, is going to be in, um, in mid June. We're going to advertise it properly. And there are going to be, I think, over 30 speakers. And, and uh, so anyone interested uh, to tune in, you're most welcome to do so. And uh, thank you very, very much again, uh, Robert, for a great talk. I really, I really learned a lot and it got me, it got me thinking and, and, and going. Many, many thanks for that. So I wish all of you uh, a really nice evening and, uh, and I hope to see you soon. Bye bye.